Edward L. Bernays, you're the father of public relations. What led you, more than 60 years ago, to see the need for public relations? <coughs> I was a member of the United States Committee on Public Information in World War I. And I worked with the committee to make this the war, the war to end all wars, which was Wilson's idea, and the war to make the world safe for democracy, and to popularize throughout the world the 14 points. And I found that ideas were weapons and were even more effective than bullets because when Woodrow Wilson said freedom of the seas, the Swiss, who had been neutral in the war, recognized that they depended on freedom of the seas and came over to our side. And when one of the 14 points said, uh, independence for ethnic entities, various ethnic groups on the Baltic Sea who were owned a part of Russia decided that they wanted to be independent. The Lithuanians, the Lats, and the Estonians. And when I got back from the war, I recognized that ideas could be as important weapons as anything. And first, I called what we did publicity direction. I would direct the conduct of people so that they could win through ideas their public goals. And soon I found out that I could give advice and a person could win his or her goals, whether it was to become an elected official or whether to become the head of a corporation or whether to sell ideas or a product. And I found out that one action that they might commit would destroy whatever reputation had been built up through public visibility. If a politician called somebody a Pollock or a chink, as I remember somebody did some years ago, they would lose their place in a democratic society. So I decided that if people wanted to meet their goals, which always depended on the public, even in the case of a hermit who had to be fed by somebody, that it was basically important to have actions considered as carefully as words. And we changed the name of what we did from publicity direction to counsel, which I took from lawyers, advice on public relations, which really means on their relationships with the public. And since everything in our society depends on the consent of other people than ourselves, it obviously was a field that would help people win their social goal. And I added the word social because I was not going to do this for the Ku Klux Klan or the Birch Society or Mr. Hitler who asked me to work with him or Mr. Samosa of Central America or Mr. Franco of Spain because I didn't think they fulfilled a social activity. Well, very soon after we did that, I decided that in order to get recognition for this concept, I should write a book on what it was all about 
and I wrote Crystallizing Public Opinion, and then I decided that the only thing that could not be bought in the United States at that time was a university lectureship, because at a university, the thesis says that they will only give professorships or teacherships to people who serve the public interest. And I talked to New York University and they said they would be glad to have the first lectureship on public relations. So you taught the first course in public relations and, and wrote the, the, first the first book. textbook in public relations. Is that concept engineering of public consent? That's, that's your concept. And that's based on the Thomas Jefferson principle, uh, principle? That in a s democratic society like our own, the consent of the public is basic to anyone's meeting his or her social goals. Do you also believe that the consent of the public is basic for corporate goals too? Well, obviously. If it's good for an individual, it's equally good for a corporation, and it's equally good for a hospital, or it's equally good for a child welfare institution, or it's equally good for a mental institution. And one reason why it is so important is that in the United States, every idea that wants to establish itself whether it's to sell more paper cups that we work with, or to make people more honest or, or more virtuous, depends on public consent. And so we worked out the engineering of consent, which applies to any social goal, but people who don't have social goals, unfortunately, can also employ it but we depend upon a democratic public that theoretically and practically wants to be led to where it wants to go, which hopefully is sound, uh, a sound life in every part of the life. This can be applied to anything from a university to a government department to a hospital, to a bookstore, or to uh, a furniture manufacturer. I would like to hear some anecdotes that you have to tell about advising United States presidents. You, ad you have advised presidents from Coolidge to Eisenhower. Can you tell what some of their problems were and oh, how sure. you helped well, count? Well, in one counting? case, in the case of Coolidge, I was called up and Arthur Woods, who was police commissioner of New York at that time, and who married one of J. Pierpont Morgan's daughters, he was the wealthiest man in the country, called me up and said, we would like to retain your services. And I said, why? They, he said, Calvin Coolidge, is concerned that a remark made by Alice Roosevelt Longworth, who was the daughter of President Theodore Roosevelt, would ruin his attempt to become President of the United States. He had an interim position because Harding had died and he was President in the remainder of his term after his death. So they engaged my services and I wondered what I could do to change the impression made by the words, Coolidge was weaned on a pickle. That, <laughs> that was a problem. <laughs> what did and, you do? And so I decided that at that time actors and actresses did not quite belong to a family home or a family party 
And I decided that if President Coolidge had breakfast with Al Jolson and the Dolly sisters who were ecstasiastic dancers and Charlotte Greenwood and other actors and actresses, the public would recognize that he was an extraordinary humanist kind of personality and that obviously he couldn't have been weaned on a pickle he must have been weaned <laughs> on pure milk. And so what I did was to tell Colonel Woods to hire a couple of sleeping cars, Pullman cars, take them down to Washington overnight and have breakfast with Coolidge. And as these actors and actresses came in, I'd say, what is your name? And they'd say, Al Jolson. Mr. Jolson, President Coolidge. And we had no contact with the newspapers. So they were the principal media. There was no radio and no television. And next morning, there wasn't a newspaper in this country. And there were about 2,000 dailies then and 10,000 weeklies that didn't have a front page story that says President Coolidge breakfasts at the White House with Al Jolson, the Dolly Sisters, and other Broadway stars. And the New York Times, in its second headline, had the line which said, President nearly laughs. <laughs> <laughs> and what the effect of it was, obviously, at that time, Gallup was not yet around, but Mr. Coolidge was elected president of the United States, and I have a letter from him hanging on my wall. Do you suppose most world leaders are uh, advised by public relations today? councils today? Yes. Why is that important? It's basically important because uh, people power rules every country, including Russia. The Tsar of the Russian, who was the most potent character in the world at the time of World War I, was assassinated when Mr. Stalin and Mr. Lenin and Mr. Trotsky came out of Switzerland where they'd been during the war and overthrew the Tsardom. That is an example of people power that shows that it's basic. When Ed Murrow made his talk against McCarthy, it was one of the principal elements in getting McCarthy out, who was after power. And people power is important whether you're selling goods, running a university, having a philosophy, a political or any type of philosophy, selling a book, uh, wanting a career of importance. There are 431 different ideas aiming at you every day to do something different from what you did the day before. You wake up in the morning, and if you listen to radio, you hear the advertisements. You hear them now even on nonprofit radio. You go downstairs, and you uh, open the television, and you get uh, a, a tax on you to buy one kind of breakfast food and then a tax to buy another or to buy one kind of motor car and then another. You go out on the street and see a taxi cab uh, advertising a local theater that's competing with each other, <coughs> uh, with another. You talk to a friend and he tells you not to use 
uh, caffeine, but to use uh, uh, ca decaffeinated coffee. And there are 431 ideas. Oh, you look at the newspaper, and there are about 330 ads. One tells you to buy at this store, another at that, another tells you to go to a health club, another health club tells you to go to that. And here you are with 431 ideas, and most people who are going to achieve anything having a goal. Well, unless you can take that goal and organize your approaches to it, you may be lost in the shuffle of the ideas because number one, you may be doing the wrong thing and number two, you may not be doing the right thing. And unless you have an organized approach, for instance, if you wanted to become Barbara Walters, the way to achieve that is to practice what I call the engineering of consent, consent of the public, towards achieving your social goal. Well, the first step in such an effort is to decide on your goal. In other words, in five years, you want to be the equivalent of the Barbara Walters of your time. The second step is to find out through research whether the goal that you have in mind is achievable. If your goal was to be Pope, your research would show you that you'd have to compromise <laughs> by being uh, in another denomination <laughs> <laughs> and not being Pope. The other element in the research, after you found out whether it's possible, is to find out how to accomplish your goal. Well, research can find anything that can be found. If you should write to 10 of your role models and tell them, which would be true, that you're writing an article, how to achieve their eminence that will be published in broadcasting magazine and you get them to accept it, obviously you will know how to achieve your goal. Then, after you've done that, your fourth step I'm sorry, your third step would be if you find your goal is not attainable, you modify your goal to an attainable one that your research has shown you can attain. Your next step is to decide on strategy on how to get there. Your strategy can be defined by the four M's. How to use your mind power and to what extent, how to use your manpower and woman power, depending upon what you are. The next is how to use your mechanics in your strategy, which you get defined by your research. And the last M is how much money are you going to spend in out-of-pocket expenses to accomplish your goal. So mind power, man power, mechanics, Wo man power and, and woman, woman power. power. Mechanics and, and money. money are Those the are four, the four M's. M's that are part of your strategy. After your strategy, the next number is organization. How much time are you going to give to it? And are you going to use any other resources like employing a secretary when you need one, or a mailing bureau, or whatever, or a researcher. After your organization, the next one is themes and appeals that you're going to use with the publics upon whom your success depends. And there, your research will tell you what their attitudes are towards your goal, what their ignorance is, the people who can determine it, uh, what their apathies are, what their prejudices are, 
or what their ignorances are. So uh, you develop your themes and appeals and any good psychology will tell you what those themes and appeals should be and you relate them to what your research found as to attitudes, ignorance, apathy, so on, of what you would like to be. And then your next step is the timing and planning of your tactics. In other words, if you want to be Barbara Walters, you uh, write your article as the first step. Your second step might be to make a speech at a university on the subject. Your third step might be to write an article for an important journal on the needs that the American public should satisfy in the spokesman for a sound point of view. And you develop the timing and tactics of your actions. Uh, you can either start with an important event you might arrange to have a talk at Oxford on the importance of an important woman commentator, or you might make a survey and have 10 uh, economists or historians talk about the importance to the American public of getting the truth and getting life interpreted in a way that will preserve the values of our society. And you work that out on a basis of timing and planning of tactics. If it's five years, you have a five-year plan worked out. And the last is money. And those are your eight steps. Mr. Bernays, did Richard Nixon have public relations people in the White House with him? Well, one of the sad things is that when I coined the expression Council on Public Relations and thought of public relations as a profession, an art applied to a science, I was unaware, number one, that in order to be a profession, the courts have ruled that an individual who calls himself a professional, as many public relations people do, has to, this is the definition of the appellate division of the New York State Supreme Court, has to be qualified first by an examination given by a board of examiners chosen from the vocation this uh, examination is based on a course of knowledge that is taught in schools. Every doctor, medical doctor has to go through such an examination. Every architect has to go through such an examination. Every engineer, whether he be electrical or civil has, or whatever, has to go through this examination. And every uh, profession that calls, uh, where the people call themselves professionals have to take such an examination. The examination <coughs> defines the word that the individual is taking the examination on because if the individual who passes it gets a license to practice and is registered, legal sanctions are attached to his privilege to call himself a lawyer, a medical doctor, or an engineer. And those legal sanctions permit the Board of Examiners to have him disbarred from using that particular title. He can call himself a naturopath or a quack, and he can continue to practice, but he can't practice medicine. I didn't know or wasn't aware of that when I wrote my book and thought of this as a profession. Obviously, today, 
public relations by definition is not a profession because anyone can practice it whether he or she is a criminal, a, nit a nitwit, a liar, a uh, truth teller, or completely ignorant of anything but wanting to make money. And that has gone to a point where the henchmen of Nixon call themselves public relations practitioners. And when they went to jail, the word public relations got such a bad name that I have here a list of 62 different titles public relations people call themselves to, mo to move away from the, ig uh, from, from the negativism of calling themselves public relations practitioners. There are directors of government relations, director office of communication of pub uh, public affairs, manager regulatory affairs, senior vice president public affairs, manager government affairs, manager state relations, executive vice president management public affairs, personal planning manager, public issues directors, public policy analysis directors, public external affairs directors, public policy planning managers, political program directors, public affairs worldwide vice presidents, and as I say, there are public, uh, there are 62 different terms. Anything but public relations because Anything. of the bad rap that because they got. Because of the bad rap they got. On the other hand, the people who did this, in my estimation, are very stupid because none of these names and titles are registered and licensed. And if anyone calling himself a public issues director should perchance be a criminal and go to jail the way the Nixon, Nixon public relations practitioners did, these poor people would all have to change their name again and redefine their activity. Well, now, you've been spending quite a bit of time advocating the licensing of public relations professionals. What would licensing mean to your profession? Well, what licensing and registration with legal sanctions would do, it would define the term in a way so that on the one hand, a university couldn't say it was giving public relations courses when many universities that give them give courses on how to write releases for newspapers that compete with a wastebasket and that have no good sense or meaning anyway because the psychologists have shown that People only accept in what they read what they a priori believe, that they accept nothing that they don't already believe, and that the only way to gain belief is first through research to find out whether they respond to authority, to reason, to persuasion, or to tradition. And here are universities advertising public relations courses that consist only of writing courses that compete for the wastebasket, but which, if even if they are printed, may have the opposite effect of what they're intended to do. Now, what licensing and registration will do, it is not a government function except that it defines the terms legally, and anybody who breaks the definition of what he signs when he takes his oath of office is disbarred from using the term so that the norms of the term are preserved. I decided I would make 
a historical study of how the terms came about. And I found that as early as the post-Reformation period in the, in, in the Middle Ages, uh, various uh, guilds were established. These guilds, in order to protect themselves from, from impostors, decided that they would make very strict uh, definition before a man could join, could join the Barber Surgeon Guild. And uh, this was done so that the norms of Barber Surgeons would be preserved and so that one crook couldn't uh, cast doubt on all of them. And it was also done so that anybody who called himself a bar, there were no herselfs at the time who were barber surgeons, had whatever education was available then to be that. Well, through the ages, from the, the Middle Ages to the early 19th century, all kinds of new specialized fields developed in England. <coughs> civil engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, certified public accountants, architects, lawyers, medical doctors. And they found that they were subject to imposters who on the one hand would hurt the public and on the other hand would hurt them because it was a reflection on them. So they went to Parliament to ask to be licensed and registered with legal sanctions for misbehavior, that came over to the United States and doctors, lawyers, architects, certified public accountants became, uh, went through that same process. I wish I had known in 1923 these facts because then one could have done this, gotten states to organized boards of examiners who are not chosen from the state, they're chosen from people in the activity, they have the examination and in turn that means that any university that says it's teaching courses in public relations has to teach courses that will enable the individual to pass the examination, whether it be law, dentistry, certified public accountants or whatever. We organized the Public Relations Committee for licensing and registration. That committee is now functioning. It is made up of eight members and we are all working. These are men who've been presidents of public relations chapters and we are now working to get several states to initiate this, one of them will be Florida, another will be Rhode Island, and Connecticut. And once that is done, every sound public relations individual or every sound company or hospital or public service organization that wants to engage a man won't have to spend days and weeks into attempting to analyze his character and his knowledge and most of the employers don't know what it is and the term today has gotten to be a euphemism for press agentry so that today the Nixon henchman caused 62 different titles that don't mean anything and that any crook can use 